Hi, everyone. I always... What's that? Show up your book. Hey, yes. look, I'm not going to plug, but you think I can shamelessly <laughs> plug my book up here? I'll just, I'll just do it right here. How's that? Um, you know, I always aspire to talk to crowds in Las Vegas that are sort of hungover. So how many of you uh, were as successful on the crap tables as I was last night? Um, well, so people ask me uh, about the title a lot, Invisible Robots. Um, so let me ask you a question. If you uh, go grab one of your neighbors and you tried to explain the energy in this room, the energy in this industry right now, do you think they have any idea what you're doing? They don't. I was watching the Super Bowl last uh, January, which is sort of an annual thing you do if you're from New England. Uh, sorry about that. I apologize. <laughs> <coughs> It'll be disappointing when uh, the, it ends, but right, it's been a good ride. And there were like 10 commercials with, with robots in them, but they were all physical. They were jumping around, and my favorite was a couple of robots who were eating, uh, well, there were a couple of uh, workers sitting in bleachers at a baseball game, and there was a robot behind them eating a hot dog, and the workers were saying how robots will never take our job. So the robots that are restructuring work and the workforce are the ones that no one can see. They're RPA bots, but also virtual agents that are taking more and more customer calls. They're machine learning algorithms that are making decisions. So that's why it's called invisible robots. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about um, what's needed for scale. And what an analyst should do is, is bring out some of the ragged edges uh, that you might not have heard about as much at a conference like this, which has been beautifully uh, put together. This has become, I think, the primary conference on automation in the industry. So I want to, I really want to thank uh, Bobby Patrick and his team for putting together a great event and most importantly for having me invited to it. So, so thank you, uh, UiPath. Um, so uh, we'll talk a little bit about cultures and skills. Um, human in the loop, we'll talk about that. Um, RPA plus AI, what's really the state of that? What's that really mean? And this one, uh, low, uh, lower total cost of ownership is one I won't talk a lot about, but let me just give a couple words here. Um, one of the things about scale is that companies don't know what their automation is costing them. And the rate of utilization of bots is less than 25% in a survey that we did. So the bots are back at the control tower or orchestrator, you know, playing cards, uh, they're not working that much. You know, they're going out and attacking that two-minute task that Harry was doing in the back office, or 18-minute task. So there's uh, going to be a movement towards more consumption-based pricing so that you're paying for when the bot's working. Yeah? That's a, that's a requirement for scale. And also, you're going to be looking at um, more SaaS implementations which lowers the cost of infrastructure and makes it more you know, reliable. So those are trends that we're seeing. Um, automation strike teams, we have a lot of research coming out on this, but we call them strike teams because perhaps in today's world, the center of excellence concept is too high a bar. Um, but really, the, the reason we use strike teams is very strategic for us is because they, they have to be mobile and that organizations are forming multiple centers essentially, multiple strike teams that may be focused on operations. Others may be focused on conversational intelligence or chatbots, right? So it's not one large center that might be considered somewhat bureaucratic. The whole point of this type of automation is democratization. There are so many uh, automation uh, opportunities that we have to distribute that to the domain experts. And with that, you need the guardrails that strike teams can provide. I'll talk a little bit more about that. And then finally, desktop analytics and, and process. So, and the big one, of course, is the future of work. And uh, we, we spend the last section on that. Um, now, you know, automation is the, the big tent. You know, AI is a subset of automation. Machine learning is a subset of AI. Deep learning is a subset of machine learning. But forget about the technology for a minute. Uh, let's think about the implications of all of the great technology that's evolving. 
Um, the first thing is scale. How many of you took a microeconomics course in uh, college? How many of you actually went to college? Uh, <laughs> I'm not getting a lot of hands here. I mean, it is Vegas, it is the last day of the event, I get it. Um, so scale, if you took that course, um, you know, is really, uh, the formula is three things, pretty simply. You know, it's, you, if you want to grow a business, you know, you needed more capital, more money, you needed more land, and you needed more people. Well, the new machine-driven form of scale has turned that on its head. Well, now you scale digitally with data. You look at the average revenue per employee for Alphabet, for Apple, it's $1.5 million per round numbers per employee. That's a company, those companies are scaling without people. And they're not using land, they're using the cloud. And they're not using um, lots of capital either. I mean, look at what uh, Daniel and his, his team did in uh, Bucharest in an apartment, <laughs> you know, and where they are. That was sweat equity. You know, that was inspired people with no money starting something. So it's a totally different formula for scale, and that has a lot of implications. You know, the people part of that is that you'll hear about the 12 personas that we use to characterize all work. And scale for traditional scale required um, workers from each of those 12 personas. One of the personas is called digital elite, and a lot of those are here. That's what you are mostly. There's a combination here of what we call cross-domain knowledge workers and digital elites, and I'll, I'll talk more about that. Um, and by the way, you guys are gonna do really good, so you know, you're, you're, you're in good shape. But the people you need for the scaled businesses of the future are digital elite. They don't draw from the 12 personas the way traditional scale occurred. Um, control. There are five or six different aspects of control that I, I talk about in Invisible Robots. Um, you know, probably the um, interesting one, there are many interesting ones, but you know, data control. It was a pretty even exchange when um, we first got our apps, you know, when mobile exploded and social exploded and we ha had given an app for free that we could participate in the sharing economy. Um, and that was pretty fair exchange. You know, the companies, the mega cloud vendors, they were the platforms, the digital platforms, they were getting um, our data, which we gave up happily for the convenience. But then they started to add AI to it. And all of a sudden, the value exchange got out of whack. Whenever you hit a like on some social media site, you're creating value. And that value is going to the data providers, the data aggregators, the digital platforms. So we're losing control of our data. GDPR, the, the whole issue of data privacy is going to be with us from here to eternity. But another aspect of control is as you look at the programming environment that we use for most processes today, it is deterministic. It is rules-based. Yeah. Uh, and as we build algorithmic businesses, we're going to be using machine learning to do a lot of the decision management. And so the machine learning uses probability and statistics and ratios. Um, and when you build the model, the ability to refresh those variables that are in it autonomously is one of the great magic things. You know, there's no one updating a spreadsheet with Netflix for what you, the horrible content you watched the night before. You know, it's coming in and aut autonomously updating a cluster model that's going to predict what you might want to watch. That's a form of AI light. The AI that's really interesting is when that refresh data coming in is smart enough to reconfigure the internal models. But in any case, for control, when you look at it, we're, um, you know, moving from that deterministic environment to the non-deterministic environment. Now, um, you know, I was an economics uh, person. I, I, I was an, a real economist in Washington, D.C. for a while. Um, you know, what drove the internet explosion in uh, the year 2000 
time frame was the, really the cost of searching for something went to zero. Yeah. Um, what's going to drive the next level of automation or the automation era is the cost of making a decision. As it moves to machine learning algorithms, it's going to move to zero as well. So what does this do? This has all kinds of implications for control. <clears throat> Humans that were formerly making decisions will not make them anymore. There's an emasculation, psychology issues, um, anxiety issues that result from that. Um, you know, I think the 737 MAX is going to be back online in February. That was a case of control moving from humans to the machine. And in that case, the machine fought the human, and the machine won that particular battle. So there's uh, syndromes that are being called black box, where businesses start to depend more and more on algorithms that they understand less and less. So this is an aspect of control, one of the aspects of control that we need to look at. And convergence is the physical world. It's, think of it as IoT, if that's easier for you. But it's really putting digital smarts into everything physical. Um, there are a lot of people scared about China right now. Forget the trade wars and the tariffs. That'll, that'll blow over at some point. But the real issue is that they are investing, oh, I don't know, half a trillion dollars in AI. They graduate 5 million engineers a year to what's ours, 100,000. Um, but one of the things that's, that, you know, they have more, they have more people. Uh, Alibaba has far more customers than Amazon. Yeah. So if the algorithms haven't changed that much, and we're using the same algorithms, what's going to improve the algorithms is the more data you have, the better your algorithms get. So there's a real concern with the number of people. But one of the concerns interesting to me is that I, I believe the Chinese understand the physical world a lot better than we do. Um, and they're embedding sensors, they're embedding intelligence in the digital world at a far greater rate. So they're just going to blow us away with, with data. Um, you know, our national industrial policy for technology in the U.S. is pretty um, serendipitous. You know, we give uh, billions of dollars to defense contractors randomly, ran, you know, random research institutes. I used to work for some of them. And occasionally something good happens, you know, like the Internet. Uh, but there's no direct you know, policy on AI that comes from our government. Um, Japan, that has a half a million, I'm sorry, a ha uh, has a 500,000 person shortfall to take care of the elderly. That's projected, given their demographics. You know, and they don't really allow a lot of people in from other countries. It's not really their thing. So what are they doing? Well, they're, they're building um, healthcare robots at a tremendous rate. But their plan is to dominate the world market for healthcare robots. Anyway, I'm digressing a bit. I suppose uh, I should keep moving. But those are what I call the forces of automation. The question is, are we ready for it? Are employees ready for this? Uh, only 21% know when to question the results in automated technology. Yeah, basically, no. And this is a, a survey we did for 2,000 global information workers around the world. And we asked them some simple questions here. Um, only 18% ha uh, have a sense of their career path in the world of automation. Yeah, they're not thinking about it. They're not ready. Only 25% think robotic technologies replacing some human activities will in in impact them positively. So they're not thinking this is all good. We hear a lot about goodness of all of this, particularly at conferences like this. But it's kind of not what our data is saying. Our data is saying that we have an issue of communication about what we're doing here and how we communicate that to employees is something that we're just beginning to understand. 51% have a fear of losing their job at some point. Yeah? So employees aren't ready for the forces of automation. Well, how about organizations? Are they ready? Uh, no, I don't think so. Um, could someone in my company uh, do an analysis of the automation process? No. Uh, do they have an automation center of excellence? No. And what about um, our leaders? Uh, only 20% of the, the leaders have made a clear articulation of what automation means to the business. 
and only 25% think that there's any kind of communications. And part of it is understanding, and that's, that's one of the reasons I, I tried to, you know, with the help of a lot of people at Forrester, I tried to put together a generally readable book on automation and on the future of work that didn't dive into the nuances, the 12 issue, you know, the, the, the sort of 12 machine learning algorithms that are competing for everyone's attention. So leaders aren't ready. So, so we're not really ready. And that's part of the reason that you see a chart like this. And this has been acknowledged throughout the, the two days. Um, scale continues to be a major hurdle. Um, it's really the last line that's important. You know, only 51% of companies have less than 10 bots. And remember what I said before, those bots are not the most heavily utilized. A lot of those bots are having a very leisurely existence hanging out at the orchestrator. They're not working. Um, now this is um, a, a, our, our growth chart for the market. Uh, and, you know, uh, what's interesting to me, so the, the taller green bars, are the uh, growth in services revenue to 12 billion. So you know, we're gonna have Leslie Joseph out here uh, at, my, at the last part of this. Uh, you'll be tired of me uh, by then. Um, and, and he's uh, leading the services, RPA services effort at, at Forrester. Um, and that was based on a study that, um, that, that we did. Um, 12 billion is pretty amazing growth. And many of those partners are here. Um, the lower green line is the software market, which we have at 4.2 billion. Um, you know, a bit lower um, than, than some of the numbers you've seen, but uh, we, we're sticking by this. Uh, we think this is a, a rational view of the RPA market. It gets a little fuzzy when you start to talk about intelligent process automation, which I'll define later, uh, when you start to include RPA plus AI, um, and then you start including the revenue from those AI components, um, at what point do you start to accrue those to the RPA market? Will they be, in fact, embedded in the RPA platform? Or will they be orchestrated and connected via, you know, via something like AI Fabric, and that revenue stays outside of the market? So the, you know, the, these are not perfect, they're not easy studies to make. But the interesting data point on this chart, to me, um, I've always tracked something called the services to license ratio. Can, can you just tell me, how many of you know what that means? All right? Okay, two of you. That's great. Um, I know, it's, you know, it's uh, these last days in Vegas. I mean, Vegas just drains the energy out of you. I don't know what it is. I think it's the air circulation or the lack of it. Uh, the dryness of the air, I don't know what it is, but it's just an exhausting place. Um, so the service to license ratio of 3.4 to 1. Now, the, the whole growth in RPA was based on this issue, uh, this notion of non-invasiveness, of immediate ROI. Um, you know, we're going to just control applications on a desktop and, you know, not worry about the back-end systems, which are a mess. And to modernize those back-end systems, you know, the, the skies would darken with consultants parachuting in, you know, and, <laughs> and you, they would never leave, right? I apologize to the partners that are here. Uh, I know it's a, you do some very fine work. But the whole RPA shtick was this notion of rapid deployment. And I'm going to make a comment later. I'll, I'll make it now, because it's always good to repeat yourself a little bit, is that uh, for RPA to really scale, we have to adjust this mindset in, in companies like yours that anything we do with RPA has to have an immediate ROI. It has to be immediately impactful. Because as you start to uh, combine it with other AI components, the solution becomes more transformational, more business transformation, and that's hard, and it's going to take, lo it's going to take longer, right? So, you know, we need to uh, kind of uh, massage the original gestalt of RPA and think of it a little more broadly for it to scale uh, in, in, in organizations. But 3.4 to 1 is pretty high. So I, I talk to a lot, I talk to Leslie, I talk to a lot of partners, <clears throat> I say, how could this be? Well, it turns out they're not just building bots, maintaining them, <clears throat> they're helping companies set up automation centers, operating models, <clears throat> dealing with governance issues. Um, th this stuff is very serious at companies. You know, these bots are operating with human credentials. They're operating in the most trusted application boundaries, that, that the, the, the transaction systems that are the heart and soul of that company. 
if you wanted to do something bad, you know, building a bot would be a pretty good way to do it, all right? So there's a lot of concern. Um, as you democratize and federate, um, you're turning more and more people into designers of robots. And, you know, you need new processes to ensure that they get into production in a safe and reliable way. Those are all new ideas. <laughs> and it's not just RPA. All advancing automation will be driven from the intellectual property that's in the business. So this operating model that RPA is starting is really valuable for the long term, the long term automation holistic view that companies need. So anyway, that explains a little bit why it's that high. It is going to be coming down, uh, hopefully. You know, a couple things it'll come down for. A lot of companies will, you know, jettison their service partners, thank you very much, uh, and transfer the technology in-house. They'll build, uh, they'll, they'll, you know, citizen uh, development, you know, will have bots being pushed more to uh, people in the business to, to develop. Now, this is... Um, not, not, not the best uh, example of graphics from Forrester, I must say, but um, th this is the notion that, you know, companies are building islands of automation. Uh, they're, they're bringing in, you know, six different conversational intelligence platforms. You know, one for maybe the, um, the contact center for that chatbot to talk to customers. And maybe another one to support the IT service management for help desk calls or to answer employee questions for HR. Um, so, you know, the, the conversational intelligence has, is a, a pervasive um, value in a company, but it, it's not good if you um, bring in uh, redundant solutions uh, with all of the, uh, you know, attendant uh, waste and resources and skills. Um, you might bring in, uh, you know, different digital process automation platforms for client onboarding. Um, and, you know, companies already have I don't have the data slide here, but they already have um, two or more RPA tools in the organization today, something like 45% of companies. And they project having three to five in, in, in two years. So um, I think the great talent of RPA as a category is one that's not talked about a lot. And that is central management. The thing that really separated it from just doing clever macros on a desktop, which had no central place to house the automation, was this notion of having an orchestrator, having a place to house the automation and centralize the analytics that were gonna drive the automation to the right place. So what other AI building block has a central management capability? Well, I've looked and the number is zero. <laughs> You know, uh, you, you bring in a, a, a chatbot stack for this conversational intelligence application, they assume that's the only thing you're doing. But because RPA had to manage very small task automations, 18 minutes on Harry's desk, uh, four minutes over here on Julie's, uh, maybe the task is done 18,000 times a year, great value, they had to develop that central management. And that's exactly what you need to coordinate various automations. And that's at the essence of what uh, UiPath talks about with AI Fabric. And I think the first platform company to do that well uh, will, will be very, very successful in automation, not just RPA, but in automation in general. I think there will be competition from the, um, the broader AI platforms um, that have um, you know, basically everything from text analytics to computer vision to machine learning and, and so forth, they're going to want to compete for that orchestration capability as well. So it's not clear that um, RPA will prevail in that, but I think for many applications it will. And certainly for coordinating maybe alien RPA bot, uh, bots, right? So if you have five RPA tools, it, it would be useful to have a control capability that could manage and understand the activities of alien bots. In other words, ones that weren't an Automation Anywhere bot, a UI path, path bot, and so forth. And there's, there's discussion of that uh, by uh, developers in the uh, industry you know, to do that. Now, um, this is just uh, you know, some basic ROI data. The point I'd like to make on this is uh, you know, clearly the unattended world, which is the back office, you know, is appears to have the higher ROI, right? Two to five, two to three and a half FTEs. 
<clears throat> so th what that means is if you, let's say you pay, uh, I'll pick on uh, Deloitte, 50 grand to build a bot, one time cost. And let's say you pay UiPath and your internal infrastructure, you know, maybe it costs you $12,000 a year to maintain that bot in, uh, in, in, in perpetuity. We're just throwing out numbers. That bot, that twelve to fifteen thousand dollar a year investment, should be able to offset between two and three and a half FTEs. That's the economics that are driving um, a lot of the market, and they continue to. But what's interesting about the attended target, and you know, attended range is associated with the contact center, but really it's customer service, and there are a lot of applications for that. Um, but point four to uh, one point two, but there are many more desktops. There are many more people involved. You take your, your back office uh, finance and accounting environment, you might have 200 desktops, 500 desktops maybe. You talk to these big contact centers, they have 35,000 desktops and you're getting a small incremental productivity gain for that agent. And that's where human in the loop really started. Um, and I'll talk about that, uh, the evolution of human in the loop. But really it started with the most simple interaction of that agent with a bot you pull down a, a dialog box or a menu and say, go do this automation. And that was it. And it went off and it updated uh, 12 different address fields. Um, so that's basically um, the, you know, the two worlds. <coughs> now, um, I introduced the concept of rule of five last year in Miami. So I, I don't want to go through it uh, in detail. I want to tell you what's changed from last year. Um, the rule of five has always been confusing because there are only three rules. Um, you know, and this is sort of the cognitive depression that we're in, um, that, or is it a renaissance of stupidity? I'm not sure, but the, um, each of the three rules has a five in it. And that apparently was really confusing. And I apologize for the silly bouncing uh, things here, but you know, you, if you find a task that has less than 500 clicks, um, you know, then that's good. You can automate that. There's not gonna be a lot of variation in that. Um, you know, if you um, are less than five applications accessed, you know, because the talent of this is, is manipulating applications on a desktop, right? So it's just mathematics that applications change, and when they change, they affect bot performance. And the more, the more applications you have, the greater the probability of a change will occur and affect that performance. Now, this is changing a bit because the advances in surface automation are making the bots not quite self-repairable, but they're giving much better clues as to where and why the bot is breaking, what change in the application has occurred. And I expect this to advance at, at great speed. There's less issues with maintenance of bots due to breakage this year than there was last year for a couple reasons. One, these operating models that are evolved, um, you, know, it, uh, you know, these big companies, you might have the SAP development team, you know, over in building G, and they never would think of coming over and talking to the people that are building bots, you know, in building F. Um, and they'll just make a change and break every bot that's going, right? So now they actually communicate and say, oh, by the way, we're doing this change, you know. Um, so that, that's helped. So that's not as big a deal um, as it was last year. Uh, and the decisions um, are still a big deal. You know, RPA is, and th this is sacrilege on this stage to say it, but it's pretty dumb. Um, there's no inherent rules management. Uh, in, in, in most of my career at Forrester, I was covering things like business rules and business process management. And they had embedded rules management. You know, what does that mean? That means I can view the rules. I can view them in an English-like language. There's versioning on the rules. Um, you know, the rules are still deterministic. You're not using machine learning to make the decision. But there's a, uh, a concept for centralized rules management. What you have in an RPA script is a, is, is a bunch of scraggly script code that has uh, the decisions embedded in it. So when you get beyond a certain complexity of decisions, um, you end up building a bot that's expensive to maintain. I had one telco um, call me, I, I won't mention the name, uh, but probably half of you are using it. And uh, they read my report, 
and said, uh, you know, we're not getting the, uh, the ROI that you said we should in our report. So immediately it's my fault, right? Uh, uh, and I said, well, tell me about what you're doing. I said, well, and, and I found, it turned out they had 90 decisions and they had three people maintaining their bot. Uh, and, and this thing was no one could understand, you know, how this thing is. So one of the key things about a control framework in your, in your, in your strike team is having coding standards. Because a lot of times it's just badly written scripts that are, make maintenance difficult and, and can make the, the applications access issue um, you know, bigger. Uh, there's always this constant debate uh, between APIs you know, versus desktop automation for access to data. Um, and it, I always find it very amusing uh, because if you're a BPM type company or you, know, you think APIs are you know, God's intended way for all data to be exchanged. I mean, you really do. There, you know, the, the, the narrative is something like this. There's a reason we invented APIs, you know. I didn't know that, yeah. Because we can insulate the changes at the application level from the underlying connectivity. That's why APIs exist. Yeah, that's why the great talent of RPA is its great vulnerability in that it's manipulating directly, as a human would, these applications. So it's very susceptible to changes in the application. But really, there doesn't have to be a debate at all. Uh, automation requires both. Uh, and RPA, uh, you know, my biggest comeback to the, the, the discussion is 85% of, of, um, of applications don't have APIs at all. <laughs> you know, and uh, I think it's actually 80%. The 20% that do, 50% of those are older SOAP-based APIs. They're not even modern web services APIs with Swagger documentation and everything else. So there's a reason that um, these older systems that never had the business case to do data integration are now being served up and doing very productive things with RPA. Yeah, but it's an interesting debate that'll probably go on for a little while longer. Now, I'm gonna accelerate to um, a couple things here. This is, um, the trajectory of, of RPA as, as we see it at Forrester. Right now, we're in the rule of five stage. But very quickly, we're moving to stage two, which is all about unstructured content. Right, this is about emails and documents. It's about a layer of text analytics that can rip through that information, extract the data, create a tagged set of information that can tell a bot what to do. And that is a brilliant set of value for thousands of companies. Probably a third of my calls on RPA right now are on what is the best combination of RPA and text analytics. Should we go with the text analytics that the RPA vendor has built in their platform? Should we go with a more generalized platform that may do other things? Uh, big, big set of questions for that. So that's a really positive area. Stage three is we need to do some work. When I was looking for, you know, we did 60 references checks, which is pretty torturous really. Uh, talking to all you guys about stuff, you know, it's really, and you know, I'm ready to retire, I'll tell you. <laughs> but I kept searching for, j just throw me a bone here. Give me one um, use case in production that does any of stage three type of interaction of, um, you know, show me a chat bot that is doing conversational intelligence, understanding the intent of the human, and then is launching RPA bots to go and complete a transaction. Just give me one. Better yet, give me one where the orchestrator or the control tower um, is, is, is understanding that a digital worker has reached the limits of what it can do in its rule of five state, and an event is sent to a, you know, a Microsoft uh, machine learning algorithm environment that's making a decision, telling me what to do next, and then the control tower launches another digital worker that can do that. That's how you manage exceptions and that's how you manage variation. That's how this whole category of digital workers gets smarter. And there, we have a lot of work to do because I, I wasn't able to find a single production reference doing that. Now, um, you've heard a lot about human in the loop. And um, I'm, I'm a big fan of the idea that employees will have their own robot their own personal robot. And they will be able to 
have embedded task creation capability in that. So this is um, just a view of timing of when that'll occur. So just as the level set, you know, unattended RPA today um, has no machine intelligence and it has no conversational intelligence, right? Not, that's not, it's not a bad thing, it just doesn't have those things. Um, attended RPA today is, is very limited. It's, 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 um, it's people directing bots um, and, you know, there's very little conversation. You know, give me a uh, scratch pad that I can put in my post call notes from a customer service call. I scratch it in that pad, the bot goes and does it. Um, you know, the, the agent is putting in an account number. <laughs> you know, that's it. Where it's going, it's got to go to the upper right of the two by two, which is where you have a real digital assistant. Remember the, um, when uh, the internet was just kind of, uh, you know, really ramping up and some genius came up with the shopping cart metaphor? where you checked out and you had a little shopping cart icon and you pulled things into it. Um, it, it simulated pretty well uh, what you do at a real store. And this interaction, someone's gonna come up with a brilliant metaphor for what the digital assistant looks like. Yeah? You should come up with it. <laughs> yeah, and you're working on it, I know. But you know, what, what does that look like? Is it supposed to be a little cute robot uh, that gives you the tasks that it can do and, and has a little um, you know, interface? But it's gotta have conversational intelligence. It's gotta be able to take commands from you via text and interpret those commands. Understand your intent. And has to be a level of configuration and enhancement that is really beyond what even is being considered for low code RPA or for um, this citizen development. Uh, which, which is still pretty um, techy for, I think, a lot of employees. So that's, uh, that's that. Now, this is the, uh, the process world, uh, and I like this chart. Uh, I kind of like all my charts, but, you know, that's, I probably wouldn't make them if I didn't, didn't like them. But one, one thing um, we try to do uh, at, at Forrester is create really confusing slides, and that keeps us employed by being able to explain them. Um, this is... Uh, uh, and I always get the name wrong, but what is the company that uh, UiPath bought the Snap, ch uh, snap Stop? Step Shot? You gotta change that name. It's just really too hard to, to figure out. But that's the, think of the RPA-based desktop analytics. That's where that plays. You know, that's the real contribution of RPA is focus on that human input and output at the desktop, record that. You know, put it in, a, in, in some analytics, create a heat map. Where, where's that repeatable pattern? Where's that rule of five automation that, that it can do? Brilliant. But that's a very small piece. It's very provincial. It's just looking at the machine human interaction. You know, process mining is also very provincial as well. You know, what's it doing? It's looking at the system logs of the big end-to-end -end applications. It ignores the human inputs and outputs. That was never, never very important. Um, so it gives you a visualization but historically gave you no way to fix anything. It was all visualization. The nice combination, um, getting this under the UiPath umbrella is that now you can actually, you know, do something about it, <laughs> you know, <laughs> which I think is really good. Um, the BPM layer, which is an orchestration layer, that, that's very provincial as well. That just looks at the metadata for the task map that it built, the queues that it's managing, right? And then customer journey analytics. You know, this is the, has anyone been in a design thinking course? Um, yeah, it's really, really, uh, I tell you, they're really, you know, you look at this outside in view of what a customer does at every point. What are they thinking? What are they feeling? You know, and you're writing all this down, you know? The problem is there aren't any IT people in the room. So when they, you know, they, they, they come out of it and nothing they've done for four days is actionable because they haven't considered what's possible with the underlying systems, all right? Huge provincial view there. Um, but the gap is that we need to get all of this data, you know, into a single repository and to be able to apply machine learning to it, create a data model for all of those actions. You know, that customer journey where you're trying to uh, absorb all the channel interaction and understand what the heck the customer is trying to do, you know, and then use an orchestration capability to say, what should we do next for this customer? That's a critical part. That, that's the, you know, the, you know th this conference and RPA is so focused on the back office. Transformation's occurring in the front office. 
It's occurring at the, at the customer via their channel movements and interactions. You know, so we need to have a more combined layer um, look, but ultimately if we come up with the right data model that incorporates all of these data, then we can use the machine learning capability to provide a really dynamic direction which could launch digital workers. It could it'd launch robots at the right times. That's the future of process. I'm not saying that's next year, but that's, that's ultimately where it's got to go. Okay, this chart um, is an upcoming report. It's called, a, um, an, again, another confusing chart that our, is our specialty. But this is uh, for what we're calling the intelligent process automation. It's a tech tide, which basically says to our buyers, clients, uh, here are the technologies you should invest in. Here are the ones that you should just maintain. Here are the ones you should experiment with. And here are the ones you should divest. And each one has a certain today's business value and a certain level of maturity. So if you think of RPA plus AI, you know, there's a big pullback from these moonshot AI projects at companies. You know, that they just went to the board and said, you know what, we got to get into this AI thing and we need a lot of money and, you know, um, and, and some, you know, integration company came in and said, yeah, just give us 18 months and $3 million and we'll do something really cool. Those days are gone. You know, if you don't have an ROI associated with your AI project today, it's not going to get funded. The, the really interesting part about the IPA movement is that it's taking the pragmatic and practical aspects of AI and combining them with RPA. And that's what's captured. If you look at the invest area, uh, you've got process discovery. So in a sense, it's an unbundling of some aspects of a typical RPA platform. Um, but our process discovery, process mining is there, text analytics is there. Again, that's the sec second phase of where we are now in the market. Um, yeah, and machine learning is, is very important. Domain robots experiment with that. This is the containerization that we were he hearing about um, earlier from Guy. Um, so I, I'm not going to go this in detail because I want to, I have some friends in the back I want to bring out real quickly. Let's get to the future of work a little bit. And I'm going to bring out JP Gounder in a few minutes who was my um, co-conspirator in the development of the model that's in Invisible Robots. Um, so he can explain some of the things I never understood with the model, which would be good. Um, it's really hard to find a picture of an invisible robot. This is the best I could do, uh, and it's really bad. I gotta, I gotta fix that. Um, and again, all the discussion, as I, I won't repeat my, my opening uh, you know, dialogue, but it's all about the physical robots. You know, here's a robot uh, roaming around the store. It's great for the kids. Kids love, they wanna go to the store with a robot. What does this robot do? It looks for spillage. That's its core competency. It's running around looking for, um, you know, someone like me who goes and tries to, you know, empty the coffee bins and spills half the, you know, uh, beans all over the place, right? That, that's its core competency. Uh, not being as effective as a lot of different areas. Um, it's not just the physical robots. If you look at the direction of the markets, 45% are implementing RPA or expanding, 43% uh, uh, expanding executable AI, which is becoming the, the biggest workload on the planet. What it all boils down to is this is our future of work picture. Um, and basically, we think the biggest impact is going to be job transformation. 80% of jobs will be transformed. Uh, some will be unrecognizable, <laughs> but they all will be affected uh, dramatically by automation. We think the talent economy is, is going to be a uh, morph uh, from the gig economy into something more formalized. Uh, with all kinds of um, supporting elements to give you the kind of insurance and some of the security that a, d a traditional payroll employee would have. Um, we're going to see a large exodus from the automation deficits that are uh, basically job losses due to automation. And we think there's a, a lot of really good positive jobs that automation creates. Automation is expensive, yeah? So 13% new jobs will be created with automation. And not just the digital elite in this room, uh, but all kinds of curation jobs, all kinds of uh, monitoring jobs uh, will, 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 will emerge. Um, and the net loss of jobs over 10 years, we think is 
Now that is a lot of people. This is based uh, uh, US numbers only. 160 million people, rough numbers, working today in the US, you're gonna lose 16% of those. That's a lot of people. But uh, most of the studies on this are at the 40, 45, 50% level in 10 years. Now we don't buy it. We think it's gonna be more gradual than that. But it's still very, very significant. Um, and this is the, the, the kind of realistic discussion that you need to have with your employees. I mean, you know, if you go in there and say that there's gonna be no change in the job and no change in the employment structure of the company, you know, where do you come off saying that? Um, it's easy to do because you have things like the National Bureau of Labor Statistics that has a completely um, naive view of the future of work where uh, I'll, I'll make the example with the um, location-based workers. So what we did is we took their statistics. They, 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 they mapped some 800 occupations. And then we mapped those 800 uh, occupations into these 12 work personas. And we grouped them based on the skills and how those skills align with advancing automation. So for example, there are 288 physical worker occupations where the water is creeping up, and I'll show you what that means in a million, 32 million people. It's a lot of people. But the forecast for factory automation has been way overstated for self-driving cars. For all the hardware-related AI has really been overstated in, in, in s some of our views at Forrester, not all. Um, you know, think about it. There are 500 million factory workers worldwide. And we're producing now about one to two million robots a month worldwide. So we couldn't even produce enough robots for the physical environment to make an impact on the workers anytime soon. It's just really hard to program native human agility into uh, mechanics. Um, you know, I can train, uh, you know, my, you know, if you had a four-year-old kid, you could train them to move a screw from here to here, uh, you know, in one second, two seconds, tear down the machine to do that. So these personas are you know, um, if you look at the location-based workers, the National Bureau says that there's gonna be a five to 7% increase in security guards, security guards. So we don't think that, um, you know, deep learning and camera technology and sensor technology isn't going to have an effect on, on uh, putting people uh, doing these jobs, uh, roaming around, looking for, following people around in a 7-Eleven. Um, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. So there's a lot of the world that's perpetuating a view that, we, in our view, isn't realistic and I think it's doing damage because we need to get on the stick and start to deal with some of the implications of this technology. Um, this is the PG portion of the uh, presentation here. So what you're seeing is the 12 personas and imagine that they, they're on different floors in a building, easiest way to think about it. And the higher you are in the building, uh, the more secure you are from having automation, which is enhancing and increasing uh, at, at, at a certain rate, um, affect your job. So if you're a human touch worker, you know, like a massage therapist, uh, kind of a bad example if you're a New England Patriots fan, but uh, I'll go with it. <laughs> um, sorry about that. You might want to cut that one out. Um, you're safe. In fact, there are going to be more of those. Um, if you're a cross-domain knowledge worker, the knowledge workers were viewed relative to the way a machine learning algorithm would look at the job. Um, you know, if you're cross-domain, there's so many information domains that you have to make connections across that it's just impossible to build the data model that can do that, make those connections. So you're safe for longer. If you're a function-specific knowledge worker, like an underwriter in insurance, um, you know, yeah, there are 25 variables in your decision <laughs> management. You know, you can... Um, have a machine do that relatively quickly and because machines love data they're going to go out and get social media data and other things so it's going to make the whole underwriting uh, profession really challenged over the years and of course if you're a cubicle worker and uh, those are uh, 20.7 million people and that would be anybody working in a contact center anybody working in a back office that's the target of RPA that's that's the the in some ways, the least known invisible robot that's coming into these cubicles and extracting hours uh, of human toil out of them. 
you know, they're going to be 73% automated in 10 years. That means 73% of them will be gone, okay? Now, the unfortunate thing is that most cubicle workers today have high school graduates. They're high school graduates, yeah? They're not going to stumble out of the cubicle and become a data scientist anytime soon. The digital skills gap is really amazing. You know, find a bookstore if you still can. There's a whole section of books for dummies. Yeah, a whole section. You know, um, it's not that we're dumb, it's just that the pace of technology, the pace of automation is making what we need to do, what we need to understand, and our ability cognitively to deal with it much harder and harder. Okay? So this is a bit of the challenge we have for those that are uh, near the water level. Well, here's what we should do about it. Now, um, we talked about automation strike teams, and, and basically we have some great research coming out on this uh, in, in the next month. Uh, where we go into detail on all of these, but basically your domain experts are the business. 70% um, of firms are looking at federation for RPA development. Automation strike teams, um, this is the centralized component that evangelize the automation, manage guardrails, uh, drive architectural decisions. You know, I think jump-starting projects is really good. You know, so you don't get six conversational intelligence platforms. Oh, here's your template for the uh, Microsoft Azure uh, platform. We want you to use that. And by the way, here's a license that you need. And by the way, here's somebody that can get, get you started. That's the way to get involved and to keep some kind of control o over the environment. So building the automation strike teams is important. Um, there is a very positive aspect. I know I've been a little dark at points, but there is something really positive about all this automation. Now, this is a, the centaur from uh, Greek mythology. Um, that I thought was uh, a reasonable way to, to think about this. And, and basically, if you look at the, the body, the machine strengths, the back end of the centaur, um, that's where you want repetitive task execution, or RPA. That's where you want machine learning and search and text analytics. Um, that's the heavy lifting. And machines are great at doing that right now. They're far better than we are at searching. Machines can search millions and millions of websites in a second. Um, the, human head, though, has to be, uh, you know, maintained and, and enhanced. You know, we evolved over hundreds of thousands of years, uh, some of us more than others, but um, to be able to understand sentiment in other humans. You know, think of it this way. If you were walking in a forest uh, 10,000 years ago and you couldn't tell if someone meant you harm, you might have been eliminated from the evolutionary uh, track. Right? So we have this unique talent, and we don't use it enough. We do have people that are plugged into point-of-sale machines that are, are essentially robots doing data entry and things that they're not using the native, intuitive human intelligence that they were born with. And we have an opportunity to really enhance that and make that uh, more actionable uh, for, for people. So um, there's a couple of uh, data charts. Now, UiPath, um, you know, this is putting muscle behind a lot of the things they've said about um, you know, their, their view of how to help society and deal with a lot of these future of work issues. Uh, they funded a research study at Forrester, which is really great. We love when, when, when uh, uh, companies do that. Um, and one of the findings was that we need more work certifications. That in other words, the refresh time for technology at um, 18 months to 24 months is just too fast for traditional education. So we need to drive new ways of thinking about education from, um, from the workplace. Now, forget the data for a second. In, in the robots, I, uh, you know, I, I, everyone loves to beat up on Walmart, right? Walmart has uh, 1.5 million employees. <laughs> they employ a lot of people. And they're doing some really interesting things with education. They have 200 academies, ironically, they're in uh, old warehouses that are now empty due to uh, supply chain automation. <laughs> you know, and they have graduation ceremonies where someone passes a certain level of costs and they, they set up a stage and they have a cap and gown, the whole nine yards. I talked to, you know, one woman who said, you know, I, I've never graduated from anything in my life. You know, my kids have never seen me be successful in anything. And I got my diploma. Now, my only criticism of the program 
was that the skills were very tailored to being a better Walmart employee, and they could be a little more general for moving into the middle class. But anyway, you know, good progress. Another set of data said we have to start monitoring anxiety because anxiety is something with the skills gap. When you take a process and you split it up and give the machine the perfect thing that RPA does, you actually are raising the anxiety in the employee uh, because they no longer have control of the complete process. And actually, those were pieces that they had, they knew how to do so well that there was a certain psychological ease that derived from that understanding. So it's a counter narrative to the idea that, oh, people hate to do all those boring tasks and we're going to free them from that. We're going to make them, uh, you know, we, we, we just don't know yet. We just don't know yet. But we have to monitor it. And again, forget the data. Uh, one of the interviews I did was with this amazing guy named Enzo. And Enzo was a high performing machinist for 25 years. Not just the machinist, the highest performing machinist. His shop closed down. He went off, he had to work in odd jobs. And he ma amazingly got hired back by a different machine shop that was a mile from his house. And he joked, he said, you know, I, I changed a bit, I gained a few pounds, but I'll tell you, the machines had changed a lot. A third of the time was putting codes into the machine and setting the machine up, and only two thirds operating. And he couldn't do it. He, he just, he thought he was gonna break the machine. He couldn't handle the setup part. And he went to the boss and said, can I just, can I just do the machine? And, and the boss says, you know, Enzo, we love you here, but you gotta do the whole job. So there's a whole set of anxiety uh, issues that are gonna result from the faster pace, the digital skills gap, and the way we insert automation into jobs that people do today. Now, I would like to, um, bring on two of my colleagues at this point. Let's have JP Gounder come out and Leslie Joseph. Maybe they abandoned me. No, here they are. Hello. And Leslie Joseph. So, uh, you know, why don't you guys just introduce yourselves and talk about um, anything you want to. Um, I'll start with you, JP. Hello everyone, I'm a colleague of Craig's and I also work on the future of work. And as I was listening to his wonderful talk, I thought I'd leave you guys with one other concept from our research that might be useful in your journey. Now, as we go on this future of work journey ourselves, we try to build an organization in which human beings and bots are increasingly working side by side, they're working together. That's not gonna happen overnight. As you heard from Craig, People aren't ready, leaders aren't always ready, organizations aren't ready. So we've introduced a concept called RQ, the robotics quotient. And it's a measure of how well individuals and also organizations can adapt to, collaborate with, and drive business results from increasing levels of automation and AI. Now the thing I want you to take from that is that you have three levers to pull. You have your people and investing in upskilling, investing in cultural engineering, helping people get the skills and inclinations that they need to work with increasingly a bot-filled world is going to be crucial. Change management goes with that as well. Second, you are leaders, and you have the ability to impact how this goes as well. Becoming, for example, a beacon of trust. Your employees will be able to trust these bots better if they trust you. And finally, the organizational things, which Craig has already covered but moving beyond sort of center of excellence into this world of strike teams, into this world in which we're highly flexible and adaptive. Those are some very quick lessons I hope you will take to heart. Perfect, JP. Thank you. And, and by the way, JP was a lot of the brains behind the model that I showed and the data. So if you have any issues with the data, that would be to JP. Um, <laughs> Leslie, tell us about you. Thank you, Craig. Great presentation. Um, there's this uh, apocryphal story um, of this kid who just joined fresh out of college and uh, into the back office function of a iconic Singapore hotel. Um, and he was sitting in the basement and he downloaded a free version of uh, one of the RPA tools and automated his entire job and said nothing about it to anybody for three months. That was all he did. Um, 
and you take that and you compare and contrast it to the fear in the eyes of somebody who has been a tenured worker for 20 years, 15 years, and who looks at an RPA demo and says, hey, that's my job, and you suddenly start to realize that there's a lot happening here, right? So there's a whole generation of people coming into the workforce for whom uh, automation and machine intelligence is just part of the zeitgeist. It's, it's the air that they breathe. And you suddenly start to realize that making automation work in this context is really hard work. It's going to be a lot of work. Now, services companies, they're fundamental to this whole process. They're a part of this ecosystem. And in a very massive way, they've had to transform themselves before they were able to, they were able to bring this transformation to you, you know, across whether you talk about consulting and advisory firms or, service, uh, or system integrators or BPOs, they've had to go through a transformation journey of their own across you know, service delivery, back office, talent pools. It's been so fundamental to what they've been doing over the last couple of years. And so now they've come and they are able to bring some of this, this learning, this knowledge to you. So in fact, just yesterday, we put out um, the Forrester wave on uh, RPA services providers. So I encourage you to go check it out. But we've looked at a list of about 13 vendors um, who support some of you and some of your partners in, um, in uh, some of your customers. Thank you, Leslie. That's, uh, that's great. And uh, yeah. that, that, that you really should look at his, his wave. So uh, we're out of time. I wanted to leave you the one thought. Um, you know, everyone says we're just going to automate, automate, automate anyway. But it's, the future is not cast in stone. And it's based on the decisions we make as individuals, and we can encourage organizations and governments to make. And I'd say that the, this conference and the people in this room, you can all make decisions if we think a little bit broadly about the implications and endeavors of our work. Thank you very much.